Okay, so hello again and welcome to this continuation of our study of evangelism. In this video, I want to talk to you about some short ways to communicate the message of the gospel, some concise ways, the gospel in a nutshell, if you will. In an earlier teaching, I talked about giving uh, prescriptions. I, I said there were these prescriptions that we could prescribe to people and give them sections of the Word of God. That's kind of what we're doing here. Uh, it's, it's another kind of set of prescriptions, but these are ways that you can understand what the gospel is in short fashion so that if you have some time with somebody, you can present it to them. First of all, I want to say that, you know, we've covered a lot of things and it might seem complicated to you. Um, there is much to study, much to understand, but always remember this. The essence of the gospel is really simple. The gospel's about how we come into relationship with God. That's what it's really about. How do you come to know God? How do you get uh, reconciled to God? How do you relate to God? I always show people the Bible. I said, this is the Old Testament. That's the old way of reconciling to God, of coming to God. This is the New Testament. It's the new way by which we draw near to God. That's basically the essence of the gospel. It's how you can enter into relationship with God, have your sins forgiven, and obtain eternal life. So it's simple, and basically the, the whole essence of the gospel is just a person. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the gospel. Let's face it, the four gospels are what? They're the story of Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, and so forth. The things he taught, the things he did. So the, the gospel is the Lord Jesus. And many scriptures back this up as well. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said, I delivered the gospel to you, and if you've trusted that, then you're saved. And then he, then he sort of recites what the gospel is in a nutshell. He says, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, he was raised again, and then he was seen by lots of different witnesses. So there you have the gospel in a nutshell. And um, in 1 Corinthians uh, 1, at the end of the chapter there, there's a couple verses I want to read to you. In uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 23 through 25, Paul says, We preach... Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ is who we preach, right? He's the message. And it's interesting that in Romans 1, uh, we looked at in an earlier study, it says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for the gospel is the power of God. So the gospel is the power of God, and then 1 Corinthians says Christ is the power of God. So Christ is the gospel, you see. And also in 1 Corinthians 1, a little further down in verse 30, it says that because of God, we are in Christ, who has become for us wisdom from God, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. So, you know, he is, the, he is our salvation. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin... Uh, is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So it's, it's, there's a lot to learn, there's a lot to know, but basically remember, it all boils down to the Lord Jesus Christ being given to us by the Father to reconcile us to himself. First Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his own body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live unto righteousness. And uh, then in John 1, 12, it says, as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become children of God. So it's receiving Christ, that's salvation. Paul said in 2 Timothy 2, 8, Jesus Christ is my gospel. So just remember that. It's simple. And, and one of the most uh, beautiful passages I love so much is Luke 2.30, where Simeon, the old man who was filled with the Spirit, God had revealed to him that he wouldn't die before he saw the Lord's Messiah. And in Luke 2.30, he comes into the temple when Mary and Joseph are there to dedicate the baby. And he's led by the Spirit over to them. And he takes the baby in his arms and he says, Lord, now you can let me depart in peace because my eyes have seen your salvation. And of course, Jesus' name was Yeshua, which means salvation. So he really said in Hebrew, my eyes have seen your Yeshua. I've seen your salvation. What's, 
the salvation of God, well, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all in him. Okay, so don't don't get confused. It's not, there's a lot to learn, but it's not complicated, right? Now, that being said, let me give you some ways you can present the gospel when you get a chance, when you talk to someone. And, you know, I've had many opportunities in my life. One night, I remember outside a laundromat doing some laundry. There was a guy outside. I started a conversation with him. And we reached the point, and he said, well, what is the gospel? Can you tell me it? And I said, well, sure. And I was just going to start, and his mother and mother, his mother-in-law and, and wife came out and said, we're done. we got to go. And so it was like, we had minutes. And I said, just give me like three or four minutes, okay, and I'll tell you it. And so I presented it to him. That's why I'm teaching this to you, because you, you, you need to know ways to present the gospel when you get a chance. The first way I'm going to give you is what I call the Romans Road. And now in each one of these, I'm going to have a slide, and you're going to be looking at the slide as I talk, okay? So I'll give you the scriptures, but you'll see them there. And uh, you can stop the video and write these down. In fact, this first one here, the Romans Road, uh, when I was first getting started, I, I wrote this in my Bible. I said, turn to page so-and-so. And when I got there, I said, turn to page so-and-so, and I so I could remember where to go. And you might want to do that. But just look at the slide. Let me go over this. Basically, what, what it's called the Romans Road because it's all from one book, the book of Romans. All the scriptures just come from one book, so you don't have to go all over the place. It's easier for people to learn that. And you're going to see that I'm going to also give you what I call the Hebrew Road. There's a Romans Road from Romans, but I'm going to give you the Hebrew Road, which is for Jews who don't accept the New Testament. I'll give it to you simultaneously, and you'll see it there on the slide, okay? So that Because there are Old Testament scriptures that say, everything I want to show to you in the New Testament, in Romans. So you can show it to a Jewish person who doesn't accept the New Testament. So here we go. Romans wrote, the first verse is 323, where it says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we talk there about the problem. That's what I've been talking about in these teachings. We've got to understand the problem first. What's the problem with mankind? Our sin. It keeps us from God. We've all sinned. And you can explain to the person what sin is. It's missing the mark. It's breaking God's law. It's having something between you and God. What you know? Just explain what it is. Romans three ten there says there's none righteous. No, not one. So sin is universal. It's our problem. Now the Old Testament scripture you can use for that is is Ecclesiastes seven twenty. It says there's not a just man on earth who doeth good and sinneth not. So the same truth is taught in the old and the new. Okay. The next verse, Romans 6.23. So 3.23, then 6.23. In 3.23, we have the fact of sin. In 6.23, we have the result of sin. It says the wages of sin is death. So it's not a slap on the wrist. It's so serious. We're dying physically now, but we will also perish eternally if we don't get forgiveness and get reconnected to God. The wages of sin is death. In the Old Testament, Ezekiel 18, 4 says, the soul that sins shall die. And of course, you can also show a person, Genesis, where Adam and Eve sinned and God said, you're going to die. And then uh, like Isaiah 61, 2 says, talks about the day of God's favor and the day of the vengeance of our God. So remember, the sword is two-edged. You always have to talk about the righteousness and the wrath of God to understand the, the fullness of the gospel. The third verse, Romans 5, 8, God commends his love toward us and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. So sin is our problem, but God has a solution. God loves us. He doesn't want us excluded. He wants to save. He so loved the world he gave his only son, right? And so Christ died for our sins. Now, that's where a modern person has difficulty. They say, well, why do you have to do that? So you might want to explain how, you know, again, the wages of sin is death. Somebody had to die. The punishment is death. And so Jesus took our place and died for us. First Peter 2.24, he, he took our sins on his own body on the tree and died for us so that we might live unto righteousness. Romans 5.10 says, so that we could be reconciled, so we could be forgiven. He died so that we could live. You know, even when you eat every day, the food you eat, something had to die in order for you to live. Christ had to die in order for us to live. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who knew no sin 
to be a sin offering for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, if you want to use an Old Testament with a Jewish person, an Old Testament verse there, Isaiah 50, 53, you know, the end of 52 and, and all of 53, but especially 3 through 5 and verse 12 in Isaiah there, tremendous verses that show how Jesus was a sacrifice of atonement for us, and he bore our sins and our punishment. So the all of sin, the wages of sin is death. God loves us and Christ died for us. And then the last verse from Romans is 10, 9, 10, and then also you can put 13 in there. Romans 10, 9, 10, and 13. Because we got to show people, even though Jesus did this, it doesn't just take effect automatically for everyone. Everyone has to receive the Lord Jesus. And how do you do that? It says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Verse 13 says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So you want to show the person, you need to personally call on the name of the Lord. Confess Jesus as Lord. Confess your sins to him as well. Ask him to forgive you, right? Believe God raised him from the dead. Show him that verse. Use it as a way to, to bring him to prayer. You can accept Christ with me right now if you'd like to, if you want to call on the name of the Lord, if you want to confess Jesus as Lord. So there you have it, the Romans road, and also I'll give you a Hebrews road. By the way, that last, the, the corresponding verse in the Old Testament for the last point, Romans 10, 9, 10, 13, comes from Joel 2.32. It says the same thing. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So we need to call on him. So that's the Roman road. And I gave you that little, uh, you know, uh, facetiously, I said the, the Hebrews road there. The next way I want to share with you to, to share the gospel is called the Four Spiritual Laws. This was developed by Bill Bright, who founded Campus Crusade for Christ years ago. He's passed on now. But um, he developed this little booklet, and it was useful. I've used this many, many times. He says, you know, um, and this is how you present it. You just say to the person, you know how there's natural laws like gravity and stuff and health laws, dietary laws, things like that. If you eat too much, you know, you'll, you'll get fat and whatever. Well, there's also spiritual laws, he says. So you share with people, there are these spiritual principles. I want to just share with you four of them that are kind of the essentials that you need to know. And so there you have them on the, on the PowerPoint slide. You can see what I'm talking about. The first principle is God loves you. He has a wonderful plan for your life. You can use verses like John 3.16. He loves you. He has a wonderful plan. God meant well for you. He put man and, and woman in paradise. Let's face it. His plan is for our good. But the second principle is there's a problem that interferes with that. And what that is, of course, is sin. Our sinfulness separates us from God and from what he has for us. That's why the world's a mess. And you can use Romans 3.23 there, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. But you need to maybe explain what sin is. It's our attitude of independence. We don't need you, God. We're going to live on our own. We're going to do things our own way. It's, uh, you know, the idolatry of self. It's disobeying God's laws and so forth. It, but sin is the problem. So there you, you deal with that aspect of, of the message. Remember, the sword is always two-edged. There's the righteousness and the wrath of God in every presentation of the gospel. The third principle or law, Christ is God's only provision for our sin. You see, there's no other way. That's why we, people get angry when you say that Christ is the only way. Well, how could that be? Muhammad could be the way. Buddha could be the way. There's lots of ways. No, because only Christ deals with the real issue, which is our sinfulness. That's the problem that has to be resolved, and other religions don't deal with it. In the Christian gospel, Christ is the only provision for our sin. John 14, 6, nobody comes to God except through him. 1 John 2, 2, he is the atoning sacrifice, the propitiation, that's the theological word, for our sins. There is no other that God accepts. And so Christ is the only provision. That's the third principle. Now the fourth is this. Christ did everything that's needed, but that doesn't take effect automatically in every person. Unless each one of us receives him, we won't experience the benefit of what he's done. So the fourth principle is all must receive him. It's not enough to believe that Jesus did it. You have to personally receive him into your life. 
You can put John 1.12 there or Revelation 3.20, John 1.12, to as many as received him, to them he gave the power or the right to become children of God. And of course, Revelation 3.20, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him. And so you just show these people the four principles, these four principles. And, and you're concluding there with that fourth principle saying, would you like to receive Jesus now? You need to do that. I can lead you a horse to water, but I can't make it drink. I can lead you to Christ. I can't make you drink. You have to drink on your own. Speaking of that, I'll take a sip. So <clears throat> that's the four spiritual laws. Now the next one is even simpler. It's only one verse. And all of you can learn this one verse and use this to share the gospel. I recommend you just ponder this and make it your own. Meditate on it. Memorize it. Learn how to use this. I've done it countless times. You only have to know one verse in the Bible to show the whole gospel because all the essential components are there. <clears throat> it's John 3.16. You know this verse. You just need to think about the, the way to present it to a person. <clears throat> so you can say to the person, look, could I, could I read a verse to you and just talk about it with you? You turn to John 3.16 and you show them there. What does it say? Well, it says, God so loved the world. So all you do is just kind of unpack those words and th those phrases. What does that mean? Who is God? Is there a God? Yeah, there is. He made everything. How do you think the universe got here? God made the universe. God made you. And God is good. <clears throat> he loves you. You can trust him. You know, if you even look at nature, look how beautiful it is. Look how this planet provides all the things that we need, the right atmosphere, the right gravity, the right, the right temperature, oxygen, and so forth, the food that we eat, so many good things in life show us that there's a good God who made us, right? Paul referred to nature a lot when he preached the gospel, and you can do that too. <clears throat> Refer to little children, how beautiful they are, things like music that we enjoy. We all enjoy music. God made it, you know? Uh, all of us enjoy different foods and all the flavors there are, so many things. So God is good. You can trust God. He loves you, right? He loves the world. That's everybody. That doesn't just mean nature. That means the people. So you explain to him, God loved the world. That means you. What's your name? Bill? Put that in there. God so loved Bill. Sometimes I'll do that with people. So God so loved Sally, right? Say your name. God so loved me. That what? Well, he did something. He didn't just stay up in heaven and say, I send you, you know, my well wishes. All my thoughts and prayers are with you. No, he took action. He did something. He gave us a gift. He gave us the very best he had. He himself came here in the form of his son. He gave us his son, the Lord Jesus, to model life for us, to live the life that we have all failed to live. But then to be surrendered into the hands of wicked people and to bear the punishment that we deserve. So show that to them. Who, you know, Jesus is a person of history. He really was born in Palestine in the first century, and he impacted thousands of people in his life. And then they learned of him, and he, the miracles that he did made them know that he was God's uh, chosen one, he was God's Messiah. But then he went to the cross and died. And so he, he was a sacrifice. He, and you can explain there as they allow, as time allows. Why does somebody have to die? Because the, gen, the, the sentence of death was on the human race. Somebody had to pay that price. No human being was good enough. Jesus did it for us. He, he died for us. He was forsaken for us. And then it says, so that whosoever believeth in him. See, in this presentation of the gospel with John 3.16, we, we come to the part about your response right there. How do you respond to God? How does that work for you? It doesn't take effect automatically. There's something you and I have to do. Whosoever believeth in him, and there you want to explain to him. Believing doesn't mean, well, I believe God exists. You know, the Bible says even the devils believe and tremble. It's not that. Remember, you got to explain to him. Faith means Biblical faith means, oh, you understand Christ died for your sins, so you need to repent and receive his forgiveness. You can be forgiven if you ask him. He's the Messiah. He's the sacrifice for sin. This is the way you come to God. So it's believing that, believing in him as Lord, believing in him as a sacrifice for your sin, as your Messiah, your Savior, and believing in him to where you say, Lord, please forgive me. I want to receive that. 
So you take action, you respond, and you receive God's gift of eternal life by believing, by trusting, by committing, and by obeying. If you believe, you obey. Remember the illustration I gave you about the wheelbarrow and Blundine walking across the Niagara River? He says, if you believe, get in the wheelbarrow. That's the idea here. If you believe, give your life to Christ so that whoever believes would not perish. So in this way of presenting the gospel, John 3, 16, we don't come to the bad news till the end. But we still come to it. Remember, righteousness and wrath, two sides of the sword. You always have to show both sides. So in this one, you say, if you believe, you won't perish. What does that mean, folks? It means you already are perishing if you don't come to Christ. We're perishing. The world is perishing. We're all sinners. Why do you think we die physically? We're all perishing. You know, the older I get, the more I realize I'm perishing. But you see, you'll not only die physically, you'll die spiritually and be separated eternally from God if you don't come to his Savior and find life. That's the only way to life. It's like in the Garden of Eden, there was a tree of life. You had to come to that if you wanted to live. Christ is the tree of life, but you have to come and eat of the fruit. You have to come to the tree of life. You have to believe in the Lord Jesus. You have to give your life to him so you don't perish. If you receive Christ, he'll make you non-perishable. He changes you from within and you and he gives to you his new spirit and makes you a new creation and you're fit to live forever. So it's just one verse, but you get the whole, uh, all the major points of the gospel there. Now, I want to talk to you about the Lamb of God, the bronze serpent and Noah's Ark. The Lamb of God, the bronze serpent, Noah's Ark. These are three stories from the Old Testament that clearly show the gospel, of course, the Lamb of God has a New Testament part as well. Uh, they all do, really. But anyway, um, in the story of the Lamb of God, if you go to Exodus 12, everybody knows about Passover, the Passover lamb. Israel was lost in Egypt. They were in bondage down there. They were suffering. They cried out to God. God cared, and so he sent them Moses, a deliverer. Moses pro proclaimed judgments. God smote Egypt so that they would have to let go of his people. And the last judgment was all the firstborn of Egypt were going to die. Every firstborn, even of the Jews, would have died. But God gave a way out for the Jews. He said, for you, if you take a lamb, slaughter it and sprinkle its blood on your doorposts, I'll pass over you and the judgment won't come on you. So they all killed a lamb and put the blood on their doorposts. The angel of death came that night, but Israel was delivered. The Egyptians all lost their firstborn, but Israel was delivered and they came out of bondage and came out from under the authority of Pharaoh and they started their way on uh, they started on their way to a new life in a promised land, okay? When they obeyed God and sprinkled that blood, that was the way out. Well, you come to the New Testament and you have Jesus coming up to John the Baptist at the River Jordan, and John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, how can a man be a lamb? Well, I think the Jewish people had hundreds of years of experience of sacrificing lambs, and they knew about the Passover lamb. They celebrated Passover every year. To them, this was clearer than it is to modern people. Jesus was the lamb. And he lived the life before us to show us that he was the son of God. But then he died on the cross and took our sin. You see, we are in Egypt. Egypt is a type of the world. We live in a fallen, dying world. And we are in bondage. They were in bondage to the Egyptians and to Pharaoh. We're in bondage to sin and to the devil. We live in that bondage to sin. We can't get free of it. We're suffering because of it. God loves us so much, he's done something. He's given us his son who came to teach us the way, but then to die for us. And his blood was poured out as the sacrificial lamb. But now look, the, the Israelites in Egypt had to believe that and sacrifice a lamb and apply its blood in order for them to be set free. In the same way, you and I today have to believe the story of what God has done, giving his son for us as the lamb of God and apply his blood to our hearts by believing, by confessing Jesus as Lord, by confessing our sins, by receiving his forgiveness, just by declaring that he is Lord of our lives, right? And following him and baptism and so forth. That's how we apply the blood. And so 
it's it's a very simple little story there, the Lamb of God from the ex Exodus and then from the New Testament. And we can see this is what you need. You need the blood applied to you so you can escape the curse of sin and death, right? Now, the next illustration is the bronze serpent. It comes from Numbers 21, but then it also is referred to in John 3. So the story there, if you're not familiar, you ought to read it. Numbers 21, Israel was wandering in the wilderness and they complained to God. They, they lost track of what he had done for them and so forth. And so they were disobedient to him and they were complaining to him. And God released these fiery serpents among them that bit them and they began to die of the venom. <clears throat> so they were cursed because of their sin and they were suffering and they were lost and they cried out to God. God heard their cry. He is merciful and he offered a solution, but it was a strange one. Because if you read the story, God told Moses, I want you to make a bronze serpent like the ones that are biting the people and lift it up on a pole. And if er whoever looks at that bronze serpent, that cursed thing on that pole that's lifted up, I will heal them of the venom that's in their veins. So very, very strange. And Moses did what he was told. He made that bronze serpent. He lifted it up. And the people who looked in faith they were healed. They weren't instantly transported to the promised land, but the venom was neutralized and they could live. What's the equivalency for us today? Well, Jesus said, as Moses lifted the serpent up in the wilderness, so the Son of Man will have to be lifted up, so whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And then he gave us John 3.16 right after that. See, look, we're in a fallen world. We're in the desert like Israel was. We're under the curse of the law for not having obeyed God. And so we are suffering. We're dying. We're lost. We're separated from God. We're cursed. We're under the curse. But God doesn't want that. He's merciful. He's made a way out. He's provided a solution. He sent his son. And Christ actually took on the form of the cursed human race. And in fact, the Bible says, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. And so Jesus actually took the curse upon us. That's why he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When he was lifted up on the cross, he became the cursed thing. He was made to be sin. Even though he was totally righteous, he knew no sin. He was made to be sin so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. But how does it take effect? It's not automatic for every human being. No, Jesus has died for every human being, but only those of us who look to him in faith, trust in that sacrifice on the cross, we believe him and we obey him and we follow him. Those are the ones. We're not instantly taken to heaven, but that venom is neutralized in our veins and we have new life and we have the promise of eternity. And we start on our way there and the rest of our life, we live for God's purposes. So you see, simple story, the bronze serpent. The final one, I, I did have time, I guess. I'll just share the final one with you. Everybody knows the story of Noah's Ark, but did you know, did you know that the gospel is revealed there? It's, it's typified or foreshadowed there in Noah's Ark. You can remember the story of Noah's, Noah's Ark. You can use this to share the gospel with somebody. Look at, here's how it works. The whole world was sinful at the time of Noah, and God was grieved that he had even made man on the earth. He was grieved by man's sin. It's not a light thing to him. He must punish sin. He hates it. He sees the hurt and suffering it causes. And it offends him. And he must punish and destroy and eradicate it. And so he told this man who, he found, who had found favor with him, Noah, that a judgment was going to come. And that he was going to judge the whole world and drown everybody in a flood. Can you imagine this? Nobody had ever seen a flood from what we understand, it had never even rained. So the people thought that was nuts. But God revealed it to Noah. He said, everybody's going to be judged. Destruction is coming. Death is coming. And yet God at the same time revealed to Noah that he is loving. He wants to forgive. He wants to provide a way out. He wants people to be saved. He doesn't want anybody to perish. So he told Noah what to do. He says, you got to build this giant boat, this ship. And of course, you know, it took him a long, long time to do. Can you imagine in those ancient times? But they built this ark. It was big. It was adequate for 
Anybody that wanted to get on board, salvation was provided. It was made out of wood. It was there for anybody who would believe. But they had to believe what Noah was saying about the judgment. They had to believe that the ark was the way out, that it would save them. They had to believe to the point where they got in. And you see, only eight people ended up doing that. Only eight of all the people on the earth. What's the equivalent for us? Which well, should be simple to see. We are living in a world of sin that's fallen. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none of us that's righteous. None of us. Our sins grieve the heart of God. We've disobeyed his law. We deserve death. And God says that judgment is coming. You see, now, it might happen. Uh, sometimes there have been judgments God sent, like armies that come and invade or earthquakes or storms or whatever. But sometimes people live their whole lives and no judgment ever comes. But guess what? The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, Hebrews 9.27, and after that judgment. So judgment is coming. You may not see a judgment fall in your lifetime here on, on this earth. I think we might here in America soon enough. But you might not see it. But you're going to see it after you die for sure. Judgment is coming. The wages of sin is death. Nobody escapes. Nobody is exempt. We've all sinned. We're doomed. That's the thing we've got to understand. We are doomed. But God doesn't want it to be that way. The Bible says he's not willing that any should perish. He wants all to repent. God wants all to be saved. He, he has provided a way out. He so loved us that he gave us his son so we would not perish, but we'd have everlasting life. We'd escape judgment. We wouldn't have to experience his wrath falling upon us. We wouldn't have to be condemned and exiled, banished from his presence eternally in the second death. He's provided a way out and it's through something made of wood. Just as the ark was made of wood, the cross of Calvary was made of wood and Jesus died on that cross and through his death there, he atoned for sin. But just like in the days of Noah, it didn't automatically take effect upon everyone in spite of whatever they might do or not do or believe or whatever, they had to get on the ark. And in the same way today, it doesn't take effect unless you believe it, unless you receive it, unless you get into the ark, so to speak, by confessing Christ as your Lord and Savior, by asking him to come into your life, by believing that he has atoned for your sins and you can be forgiven and receiving that forgiveness. You have to ask the Lord to forgive you. You have to ask him to be the Lord of your life. So there you have it. Noah's Ark, the uh, bronze serpent, and uh, the Lamb of God. <clears throat> and we've looked at John 3.16, the four spiritual laws, the Romans wrote and the Hebrews wrote. These are just some, some forms that you might find helpful to learn and use next time somebody says to you, well, what is the gospel? Can you explain it to me? There are ways that you can do that in a concise fashion, and I believe an understandable fashion. I hope that helps. Till next time, may the Lord bless you.